So Tanakota, and welcome to our participants in New Zealand. Good morning and from overseas and good afternoon um, or good evening to a couple of our speakers who are joining us um, from the other side of the world. My name is uh, uh, Karen Smith, I'm Professor of Tourism Management at the Wellington School of Business and Government and I'll be the chair for today's um, webinar. This is the third in a series hosted by the School of Management and I'd like to say thanks um, from the off to the team working behind the scenes, Abby Hart and Colette Fenson, um, who are making it all happen today. Now today's webinar is around scenarios for New Zealand tourism reimagination post-COVID-19. Aotearoa New Zealand, like destinations around the globe, are facing both challenges and opportunities from COVID-19. The industry, government, academics and communities are asking questions both about what the future might look like, but also what do we want the future to look like? Here in New Zealand, the Minister of Tourism, the Honourable Kelvin Davis, has directed Tourism New Zealand to um, alongside MB and the Department of Conservation and industry stakeholders to consider three steps, respond, kickstart and reimagine. And it's the latter reimagine we're focusing on today. We're asking what is a resilient destination? What will global tourism look like in 2025? And what are some of the different scenarios for tourism in New Zealand? To address these questions, I'm very pleased to invite a three leading futurists um, to our webinar. Our first speaker will be Dr. Stefan Hartman, who will be talking about building resilient tourism destinations. Stefan is head of department um, at the European Tourism Futures Institute at NHL Stenden University in the Netherlands. He uses his knowledge of translation management, resilience and adaptive ca um, capacity building to help those in the tourism industry develop strategies and actions to allow them to manage cont continually changing business environments. Stefan will be followed by our second speaker, Professor Albert Posma. He's also from the European Tourism Futures Institute at NHL Stenden University and is Professor of Strategic Foresight and Scenario Planning. He applies his expertise in these areas to the leisure and tourism industry, including work in recent years on over-tourism. Albert's co-editor of the book, The Future of European Tourism, and also co-editor of the Journal of Tourism Futures. He'll be talking to us second about post-COVID-19 scenarios for the global visitor economy in 2025. And our third speaker is our very own Dr. Ian Yeoman, Associate Professor of Tourism Futures here at the Wellington School of Business and Government. But he continues our Dutch flavour in today's panel because he's also visiting professor at the European Tourism Futures Institute and works closely with Albert and Stefan. His most recent publication is The Future Past of Tourism and forthcoming titles include Science Fiction, Disruption and Tourism and Global Scenarios for Tourism. And he'll be talking today about scenarios for New Zealand tourism post COVID-19. Now each speaker is going to talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll have time for moderated questions. And um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'll be asking those questions to our panelists later on. So without any further ado, I'm going to invite our first speaker, Stefan Hartman, to talk, start the debate on building resilient tourism destinations. Welcome, Stefan. Well, thank you very much. All right, I'd like to, um, to give an kind of introduction to the, uh, the, the theme of, of today. Um, my talk will be about building resilient tourism destinations. And uh, the question that puzzles me uh, is how to, how to build those uh, resilient tourism destinations. Um, and my story starts basically with um, how interconnected our world is. Um, if you will see on the next slide, um, kind of uh, representing for me, to, for my perspective, how the world is connected. Um, it's an image of how, uh, all the Facebook connections uh, throughout the globe. Um, but for me, it represents kind of the network society where we live in and um, the globalized economy. And I think the interconnections are very clear with uh, the outbreak of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but also in the past, if you look at international travel and, um, uh, and the development of tourism, it says something about how interconnected um, our, our world is. Um, and if you uh, yeah, then think about what are the implications of, uh, of such an interconnected world, um, it's, I think, good to understand a, a, a notion that I would call the, the, the global-local nexus. 
where um, yeah, it, it forces us basically to look at the interactions between the global and the local, uh, because the combination of those and uh, uh, yeah, the connections between the global and the local are very important for, um, yeah, for, the, for the development outcomes of individuals, households, uh, communities, but regions such as destinations. And it's basically the interplay um, that will determine um, yeah, also how a future uh, uh, could look like. Um, can we move to the next slide? Um, because it's something, um, because of these interactions between the, 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 basically the global and the local, um, and many tourism destinations are in a position where they constantly have to uh, respond and adapt to change. Um, if you take a look at this quote, uh, it's quite a lot about uh, being responsive to change and a important uh, concept I think uh, should get more attention is the concept of, of resilience, uh, particularly uh, in, in, in tourism studies. I think it's still uh, rather undeveloped, underdeveloped. Um, and it's about um, yeah, having a certain capacity to uh, absorb disturbance, um, undergo change, and uh, yeah, basically survive and thrive. And I think that's an important capacity, uh, a capacity to have. So if we look at resilience and explore that concept a bit further, um, it's important to ask the questions, of course, um, yeah, uh, resilience of what, so resilience uh, against what, by whom. Um, and if you think about the resilience against what, of course, we know about uh, COVID-19, uh, something that is uh, yeah, a worldwide pandemic. Um, but it's more than that. And I think it's a kind of an underlying um, uh, yeah, challenge where destinations have to work on. Um, it's about taking, um, uh, yeah, responding and recovering constantly from shocks and disruptions and all sorts of crises. Uh, which could be about terrorist attacks, uh, natural disasters, and, and of course New Zealand has uh, seen a few. Um, but it's also about um, global economic crisis, um, technologies that become obsolete. And it's a lot that um, originates sometimes from elsewhere. It's quite, quite often um, beyond the individual or beyond the control of a destination, but it's something you need to respond to and recover from. And then it's also important to ask the question, uh, yeah, resilience of what, uh, by whom? And then it's important to, uh, uh, to look at different levels. Uh, I think it's important to look at the level of an individual, could be an entrepreneur, could be an independent entrepreneur. Uh, how does this person respond to whatever happens to them and whatever happens to their, their context? And it's about firms responding to change, branches, clusters, uh, entire industries responding to change. Um, and in the end also um, uh, sites. Uh, it could be about buildings that are become obsolete uh, or redundant uh, and destinations that have to develop. Um, so and it's, all, uh, yeah, it's, it's the combination of, of, this, uh, of all of these, these aspects that need to um, kind of respond uh, constantly to, uh, to, the, to the contextual environments. So if you would ask me what is then a resilient destination, I would say uh, it's, it's about regions and it's uh, about regions that are at the same time um, robust, able to cope with change and at the same time flexible enough to, to redevelop and reinvent itself. Um, and by taking this perspective, uh, yeah, I kind of adopt a, uh, a systems uh, approach, a systems thinking approach. Um, where I uh, see destinations as systems, as, as open systems, and because they are connected to their, to their environment, uh, the contextual environment, which is related to those um, uh, different levels I showed before. Um, and I also take the, the um, perspective that they are complex. It's about multiple actors, endless interactions, um, self-organizing behavior. Uh, it's about destinations that develop and evolve in a non-linear way, um, meaning that the future could look radically different than the past. Um, and that these, that these uh, destinations are challenged to become uh, or to develop uh, the adaptive capacity that allows them to have this ongoing um, uh, yeah, kind of restlessness and to develop itself over time. Um, so in the end, it means that destinations are challenged to become resilient because they are open systems and because they are so complex. Um, that's kind of the perspective that I, um, that I take. And um, yeah, then it's also a question. So what, what does it need? What do you need? Or what does a destination need uh, to, to get those properties, to develop those properties? Um, 
So, and it's important to look at the types of resilience. Um, in literature, you will find uh, kind of in general three um, approaches to resilience. Uh, the first two is more of a traditional approach to resilience, basically the ability to bounce back. So it's about recovering. Uh, uh, but I think we are looking at, especially if you talk about tourism destinations, that a way back is always, um, uh, yeah, might be uh, impossible. And that we're basically looking at resilience to, um, uh, yeah, kind of an evolutionary or more transformative approach to resilience, where we have endless system states and that we're always in the process of becoming. Um, which means moving from sometimes one state to the other, moving from one situation to another, uh, and it could involve a radical change, as I said before. Uh, so my re uh, research is more about um, uh, recently, of course, understanding this perspective, but really understanding about what does it take to become a resilient destination, uh, which is something I explore. Um, and I try to make lists of, of, of uh, characteristics that destinations uh, should have. And I'd like to just to share a few of them. Um, because I think resilient uh, or destinations are, um, they, you can take a, a perspective that destinations are kind of on this, uh, uh, this ocean, you could say, trying to reach, uh, or, or in, in a, a mountain range, trying to get to the highest peak. But, uh, and they do so by taking small steps and exploring their environment and looking for opportunities and threats, trying to take one step uphill. And, uh, uh, but the problem is, is that the landscape is basically constantly changing due, due to all sorts of, of, of factors and forces of change um, that are beyond their control. So they try to move uphill in this dynamic landscape, uh, kind of uh, a perspective to take. But to do this, to develop this uh, resilience, um, I would say it's first of all, well, uh, important to adopt this adaptive systems thinking and uh, the perspective that I just introduced. Um, I think it's important that destinations uh, kind of increase variety in terms of, of, of products, um, uh, experiences, um, but also beyond the tourism industry. Because of course, if you become over dependent on tourism uh, and if, uh, uh, well, a sector could collapse or for reasons of COVID-19, uh, well, it could become very tricky for a destination. Uh, and variety means that some uh, activities or products could become obsolete or uh, uh, yeah, reinvented uh, over time. I think it's also important to enhance connectivity between stakeholders, um, which is, I think, in the tourism industry often lacking or underdeveloped, that we take them for granted, that we think we are connected to the other, um, but actually in practice, uh, we don't, and we don't collaborate or we don't build productive coalitions, um, or we meet just once a year, because not really sharing stories, sharing perspectives, and I think that's uh, a major issue um, in, in many destinations, because entrepreneurs all sometimes don't even have the time. Uh, they don't, uh, uh, they, they're on a survival, uh, 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 a survival mode to survive from one day to the other. I think it's also important to promote this idea of polycentric governance systems um, to connect different levels that I showed from the individual to maybe the, the United Nations World Tourism Organization and everything in between. Um, and that it's important that there are uh, that there's no one single actor in control because it might give you the sense of, um, uh, of control, which is in complex systems quite, uh, yeah, I think uh, a, a trap to be honest. Um, and it's important to support this environmental sensitivity. Uh, I, I think that's where scenario planning comes in, that you know what happens in, the, in this environment where destinations are, uh, are in and where development takes place. So understanding political developments, economic development, technological developments, etc., and know about the implications of those developments and, and develop scenarios and uh, think about the implications of these scenarios for particular destinations uh, and do it over and over. Because in the end, I think that stimulates um, learning and uh, to be uh, a, a, a sense of reflexivity that you are also able to uh, conclude that you might need to change organizations, people's products, uh, uh, yeah, to be able 
to take a next step and to be able to uh, uh, yeah, to evolve and maybe towards new future situations. Um, this is just a, a, a short list, I would say. I think uh, there, there's much more to say. And um, uh, so I'm also always uh, open for, for new items, new things, uh, uh, things I should include in this list, uh, because I think that's also where my learning comes in. So uh, very short introduction, there's much more to say. Uh, please look into also uh, uh, my academic work on this topic, um, uh, because a lot of this is in, uh, in the articles that I wrote. Thank you, Stefan. That was a really um, insightful introduction to give us a bit of context. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who's looking down your list of conditions about building resilience and, and thinking how it might apply both to New Zealand, um, but also destinations within it and for our, our international attendees for their own, uh, their own context as well. And I'm sure we'll come, come, back to, um, come back to that. So I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Albert Posma, um, who's going to talk to us about scenarios for the global visitor economy in 2025. Welcome, Albert. Albert, we'll just make sure you're unmuted, won't be a moment. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, yes, as a European Tourism Futures Institute, we have been uh, there for about 10 years now. And over the past 10 years, we have been developing scenarios, uh, and we call it strategic foresight for small businesses, bigger businesses, trade organizations, governments, destinations, and so on. And usually we do these things based on the question that we get from one of these uh, clients. However, with the emergence of the COVID crisis, we said, well, we need to respond to this. Uh, as, a, as an institute uh, with expertise in this field, we need to support the industry globally with, uh, you know, with, with uh, drafting a futures perspective. Because what we uh, see nowadays, especially in the media, is that uh, yeah, many governments and so on come with short-term solutions. Next slide, please. So uh, short-term solutions are, of course, interesting uh, because they might help to recover the industry as it was. However, uh, it could be that the global crisis uh, changed the demand, changes the demand for tourism and re requires yeah, different kinds of businesses, different kinds of concepts, new business models. And that's what we we'll try to do. So instead of uh, offering predictive scenarios, such as forecasts uh, that many uh, actors do at the moment, instead of offering goal-based scenarios, which is basically a kind of strategy you could take to, to, uh, to tackle the future, we decided to develop explorative scenarios. And explorative scenarios are literally uh, multiple pictures of how the future of global tourism could evolve. Next slide, please. So how does that work? Well, normally we bring together a, a large group of actors at the table in a workshop uh, uh, like settings, and we discuss each other's we uh, with each other's uh, with each other the, the perceptions they have. We share expertise. We challenge each other's paradigms and so on, and then we go through this process. However, with this crisis where we have to work online, this was uh, a little bit uh, more difficult. So what? did we do? We collected a number of experts from three universities of professional education in the Netherlands, associated to CELT, as you see on this slide, the Center of Expertise in Leisure, Tourism and Hospitality. And we scanned the media, experts in the media, for about four weeks since the beginning of the crisis. We made notes of everything we heard of what the experts said that could, could happen over the years to come. And we collected it, we made a list, and together we analyzed it and we clustered all these variables, all these forces into, uh, yeah, into clusters, into groupings. And then we asked ourselves the question, what is the driving force behind these different clusters? And that uh, led to a short list that you see on this slide, the attitude or the role of nation states, the attitude and role of the semi-public or the public sector, the attitude and role of large uh, businesses such as multinationals, 
and the role of the citizen slash consumer and the length and the depth of crisis. Next, uh, press, please. Uh, well, yeah, thank you. Uh, then we looked at this short list and we said, well, there are basically two of these forces that stand out because they are, uh, sorry, go back, please. Yeah. There are two of these uh, driving forces of change that stand out. One is uh, the attitude and role of the citizen, and the other is the length and the depth of the crisis. Why do they stand out? Well, one reason is because we think they are most influential for the future of tourism. And the other reason is that we think those two are the most unpredictable concerning the future. Next slide, please. Uh, if we take these two uh, key uncertainties and uh, re regard them as two axes of a cross, next uh, button, please. The first, uh, next, please. The first axis was the length, length and uh, depth of the crisis. Uh, then we looked at the plausible extremes to which this unpredictable force could develop. And then we said, well, one extreme could be a long and shallow uh, crisis and the other one a long and deep crisis. And the other axis, please press, please, is the citizen and consumer axis. And that could be uh, a society focused on the I perspective, so hedonistic, uh, uh, individualistic versus a more collectivist society. If we combine uh, these two axes with the extremes, it, we see, in fact, uh, the framework of four scenarios emerging. Please press, Karen. Uh, the first scenario we called business as usual. Uh, that is a scenario that is focused on an individualistic society and the crisis might be over, let's say, by the end of this year. Then we expect a fast recovery of tourism, uh, a return to mass tourism, a flourishing visitor economy, unstrained uh, behavior, and over-tourism comes back again uh, in, on the agenda with a high social and ecological pressure. If we combine uh, the other extremes, the I perspective, with a long and a deep recession, we think uh, about the collapse of the global tourism industry. That means that international travel has become a luxury product that is only affordable by the happy few. Many uh, bankruptcies, uh, takeovers, nationalization by governments of uh, national railways, for example, fierce competition on price and the nature and environment uh, are exploited to serve tourism. A third scenario, press, press please, is the scenario that we have called business as unusual. That's a business in transition. Uh, in fact, we have to deal with a long crisis, and with long we talk about uh, maybe five years. Uh, so we see uh, corona coming back in waves during a couple of years. And that means that uh, yeah, tourism has to reinvent itself. And it, it has to become accessible to everyone in the, in the collectivist society. So this requires a lot of creativity, innovation from the industry, we expect a lot of high-tech robotization and also new co concepts and business models. We think also that because of this collectivism, uh, there's a lot of collaboration between uh, actors in the, in the global scene. And uh, the key values are, uh, are purpose-driven uh, purpose and respect for man and nature. A fourth scenario is not a transition, but a real transformation of global tourism. And then we see a combination of a collectivist society together with a short and shallow economy. Uh, so the economy has recovered by the end of the year. And then we think that uh, yeah, many people have tasted from a, a society that's different and probably have gone to like it. And uh, that means that we see uh, the emergence of sustainable tourism, many people staying nearby. Uh, major investments will be in quality and not in quantity. Uh, and uh, people are also pre prepared to spend a lot of money or relatively a lot of money because they think they do good with paying uh, this amount of money. Uh, next slide, please. So these scenarios are just the first attempt by uh, SELF and the European Tourism Futures Institute to, to picture uh, multiple futures of tourism. And uh, this is not the end of a process. We think it's just the beginning because we challenge, we invite the industry 
uh, globally to discuss uh, with us the forces that we identified, the key uncertainties that we identified, uh, the extremes that we uh, came up with, but also to review the scenarios so that they become better and that they got, uh, they got uh, supported by the industry themselves. So it's not owned by us anymore, but shared with the industry. And then uh, we could use the scenarios as a starting point to translate it to the, to the actual situation of a, of a concrete business in the country. And that means that with, with help of the scenarios, they could uh, develop yeah, new strategies, new business concepts, uh, new business models, et cetera. And contribute, of course, to the resilience of their business, of their destination, of their organization, as Stefan already has introduced. Thank you, Karen. This is what I would like to share with you all. Thank you, Albert, um, and introducing us there to the concept of scenarios at a global scale. And this will feed into our third and final speaker, um, Ian Yeoman. Um, but just whilst we get um, Ian unmuted, um, I'll just remind you that we have got the Q&A open and we've already got a couple of um, questions in there. You can both put your own question in there and you can also upvote questions as well. And we'll be turning to the questions after our third um, speaker. So I'd like to introduce um, Associate Professor Ian Yeoman, who is going to talk to us around scenarios for New Zealand um, tourism post-COVID-19. Welcome, Ian. So, so what you've got in the terms of the work that the European Tourism Futures Institute has done and, and solved is a, is a sound basis for, for taking New Zealand tourism forward. As Stefan has mentioned, the importance is about resilience and what we mean by resilience. How, how much depth has New Zealand got in the terms of being able to react, uh, to be able to, in, in order to react to COVID-19? And what Albert uh, talks about in the framework that um, SALT and the, the Institute have developed is a, fr is, a, is a framework in order to debate what tourism is like. And, and using the framework in the terms of explorative scenarios, you have the opportunity to uh, explore, discuss, and reimagine what New Zealand tourism could look like. So they become adaptive tools in which to build on and engage with the debate in order to develop strategies, ideas, and um, philosophies about what you see New Zealand tourism could be in the future. Ian, I think you've managed to press your, uh, your mute button, so we'll just get you unmuted there. Okay, so um, basically using the framework that the, the Institute's developed and sold, basically what is the, the level, what is the length and the depth of the recession, and what is the moral dilemma of, of citizens? Next slide, please. Um, and, and so basically what Albert talked about in the terms of this framework, something sharp and shallow, something long and deep and is the focus in the terms of tourists or the way we behave yet is it about collective responsibility and a care for others or is it a strong focus on individualism um next slides please so he, here we have um four scenarios within a, within a new zealand context um Building upon the framework that's been developed by FD is basically what, what, what I've done is I tend to I tend to visualize scenarios in the terms of trying to get people to reimagine what New Zealand tourism could look like. And one of the ways to do that is to use film or literature. So we have four scenarios here. One is Crazy Rich Asians, which is based upon that film, if you've seen if you've seen it. The other one is um, The Colony, which is a 1995 um, film, which is all about gated communities. And this is about New Zealand as an island, as a colony, as the rest of the world has COVID-19. This side of paradise is actually taken from an episode of Star Trek, which is about a utopian place. But one of the issues with the utopia is it's the trade-offs you, me you make and how you get there. And the final one, Contingion, is about survival of the fittest. So basically the end of tourism as we know. So each, each of those four scenarios is based upon a range of stories. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. So basically, Crazy Rich Asians talks about the elimination, basically the elimination of COVID-19 across the world. It sort of just it sort of just went away as US President Donald Trump tweeted. And, and basically it's, it's about back, going back to normal. What New Zealand tourism was like pre-COVID-19 in the terms of high growth, um, a, a, a mixture of sustainable tourism and a, and a mixture of hedonistic tourism. And, and basically the concepts of over tourism and that word that seems to be a relic now of the past, it, it comes back in force. Next slide, please. Whereas this is the scenario that nobody wants. This is a scenario where COVID-19 spreads throughout the world. It's, it's, it's with us for, for two or three years. It's, it sort of goes on and goes on. This is a world like um, th there's no vaccine for it like we have with the common cold. We, we have social disorder across the world. Although there are pockets of tourism, in New Zealand, in, in isolated communities. But basically, it's, this is about a disparity of society, a polarization of society, where we've, got, where we've got economic apartheid. Next slide, please. Slice of paradise is the complete transformation of tourism, the rethinking of tourism, of what it means for us. It's very ultra altruistic. It's a collective approach to, the, to well-being. Right at the heart of it is environmental sustainability. And with environmental sustainability, we've got strong communities and, and, strong, communi and strong businesses. But basically, the state is the, is the initiator of, 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 of the construction of something that's 100 pure New Zealand. It's a very green destination, and it's very much a rethinking of what the country's all about. Whereas the final scenario, the colony, is about um, COVID-19 is out there. It, it sort of doesn't go away. We sort of get used to it. We live with it. Waves appear and they disappear. And, and it sort of becomes the new normal. And New Zealand is a colony. New Zealand is a one big bubble. And fundamentally, tourism is, is a strong focus on our domestic markets. So trying to make the four scenarios come alive, what do they mean? What are some of the core messages they're all about? Next slide, please. Well, that's about some of the signals that we see of these scenarios actually happening today. Next slide, please. So we're already seeing in China, um, COVID-19 completely disappeared. And where the epicenter started in, in Wuhan, that's now completely clean. And we've seen domestic tourism, for example, come back in the terms of that. This scenario depends upon a vaccine in the terms of there's hope for a vaccine because the world, collectively, there's a very strong focus on trying to find that vaccine. Next slide, please. The collapse, the collapse of world tourism is what many destinations of, of what many destinations and what is happening to, to, to many countries. Virtually across the world, international tourism has virtually disappeared. And as a concept, there's a dialogue. We've seen destinations that are dependent upon tourism and destinations or countries that have um, uh, no fallback. Um, we've seen great divisions in societies and you've just got to look what's happening in the, in the United States. And here we have the rise of protectionism and a me first attitude. Next slide, please. Whereas the side of paradise, actually, what's what's happening with this scenario? We've seen we see we are seeing us we are seeing people in the world focus on collectivism, people around us, um, be kind, share, look out for your neighbour, shop local. So there's been a, a strong focus while we have COVID nineteen to rethink what tourism is and what it could be and what it should be, and a very strong focus on communities and sustainability. And final slide, please. And again, there's examples of this. How are destinations working in this transition? How are destinations working in, co in colonies? And there's been an, an initiative from Iceland. New Zealand's talking about, talks about a bubble, et cetera, et cetera. So again, next slide, please. So what are the risks of, of these four scenarios going forward? Um, next slide, please. Well, the, the risk with Crazy Rich Asians 
It's, it's that pressure between economics and health. It's the rush to reopen. And the rush to reopen creates that second wave. Next slide, please. Whereas survival of the fittest is basically the end of tourism, a polarized society, a completely different world, and a world we do not want. Next slide, please. Whereas a utopia is, is, an op is, is the opportunity and the side of paradise and rethinking tourism for New Zealand is, are we really taking an opportunity to think about what the future could be and where we want it to be? And one of the dangers of, of paradise, it's somewhere we never get there. The like any destination strategies and any destination goals will only start the journey, but we never get to the end. The colony, please. The next slide. And the problem with gated communities is the big debate that we've got on today. It's about leakage. When will the second wave come back? It's that compromise between economic growth and sustainability. It's, 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 the, rush to get, it's the rush to get back to work and open up uh, against the health risk. Next slide, please. So if we, we talked about the four scenarios. What could the visions be for those, um, please? The first one would, would be, it's all about, let's live more and fear less. Let's just get out, let's just get out there and do it. Let's take this hedonistic approach and just get back to tourism very quickly and leave our fear behind. Next slide, please. Well, so, well uh, survival of the fittest in the terms of collapse, it's about survivor. Who's the strongest? The elimination of the weak, taking care of me. Next slide, please. Well, this side of paradise is, is thinking about New Zealand as some sort of paradise, some sort of e eco destination, a, a complete bubble that's green and clean. It's all about communities and it's all about feeling for one another. Next slide, please. And some sort of vision for the colony is, is very much positioning New Zealand in the terms of we're a cocoon with this place of isolation, with this place we're safe to come to. Um, in the terms of what it's all about. Slides, please. So what are the strategies uh, for these four scenarios? Next slide, please. So basically, strategies, crazy rich Asians, this is what industry wants. Next slide, please. Survival of the fittest, this is a strategy where we leave tourism behind. We say, during this period, there's no point in doing tourism because it's complete failure. Rethinking tourism, this is what others want. This is what others and some of you want. And the final one, the colony, this is, what's go this is what you think is going to happen. This is where we are now. This is, this is the world. Next slides, please. So some of the, the, the challenges of this slides relate to Crazy Rich Asians. It's about strong economic growth, trying to get in industry back very as quickly as possible. Whereas this side of paradise is about the complete redesign of tourism. It's not what it was um, pre-COVID-19. And the issue between these two scenarios is the conflict. It's the conflict between jobs and sustainability. And some parts of the industry actually don't want to rethink tourism. We just want to get back to normal because, because it's about business sustainability in the terms of jobs. Other slides, please. The key words for uh, the colony are about resilience, as Stefan talked about, containment, a strong focus on domestic tourism, regional bubbles, and safety. They're the key attributes of that, of that strategy. And the final one is about, it's an exit strategy. There is some tourism, but it's exclusive. So basically, some of the questions are, where have we been and where are we going? Most of the world is in this contingent scenario. It's arrived it's arrived and it's, it's playing havoc. And what they're trying to do is get to the colony. That, that They're trying to do that. That's what New Zealand has achieved. We've arrived at that colony, that colony part. The key question is where, where we are. And next, where do we want to go? Do we want to go to this side of paradise and reimagine tourism? Or do we want to or, or is it failure? We let too many tourists in and we actually, we actually collapse. So that's it. Those scenarios are just thoughts. Those scenarios are just ideas. And as Albert said, the scenarios are, the scenarios are actually playing out now. 
there's different aspects of each scenario happening all of the time. And the point of doing the scenarios, whether it's a global level or for the Netherlands or for New Zealand is they're an ongoing story. They, it's to use them as a framing device to create something. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Well, over our three panelists, we've explored what a uh, resilient um, destination is, and we've looked at the idea of how we can use um, scenarios to explore both at a global and a New Zealand level around what the future of tourism might look like. And I think also started to think about what we might want, want it to look like as well. So we're going to now open for um, questions. Um, thank you to those of you who have been um, asking those. Please pop those into the Q&A uh, rather than into um, the chat. And I'm going over there. Now I can see that Stefan's been hard at work answering a few of the initial questions um, in the text as well. But I think we'll actually start with one of those, um, one of those questions and open it up to the other panelists as well. So Stefan, I'll come to you first though. And um, looking at David Simmons question around rethinking tourism and um, a suggestion that this does not appear to fit a short-term crisis and that we really need to look at long-term behavioral changes will be needed for a transformation to a resilient regenerative tourism. Um, Stefan, do you want to explore a little bit what you started sort of responding to in type there around that sort of tension between the short and the long term? Um, yeah, I think it's a good um, and, and, and correct statement, to be honest. I think uh, um, it's very difficult, of course, to um, have long-term behavioral changes. And I think the, what we see currently, especially if you take the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, that we are in this bounce-back situation, that we really try to recover and go back to this old situation, this comfortable, nice situation where we came from. Um, uh, that we kind of want to go back to the same type of travel behavior. Also from the consumer perspective, we want to keep the same structures in place. You want to uh, save uh, and, and uh, uh, help out all the airlines that we have. Uh, well, at the same time, um, there are people, of course, and one of the scenarios is also trying to look beyond that and trying to look at what are, what are our, our uh, alternatives. But they also mean big transformations. And it could be that then if you would say tourism recovers, but in this new situation, it could mean less tourists, less income. Uh, it could have a completely different um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, set of implications. And I think that will take a lot of um, uh, either courage uh, or uh, uh, powerful uh, leaders who will um, uh, find good business models and who will, take the, um, uh, yeah, the, the challenge to develop destinations in such ways, which really comes down to, I think, leadership and uh, a good vision and uh, looking at tourism from a, uh, not a economic perspective, but from a maybe a societal perspective that we see a tourism not as a, uh, as a goal in itself, but as a means for certain societal development. Then I think it also will answer one of the other questions about are we talking about tourism or regions? I think then we are talking about regions and the impact of tourism on wider societies. Uh, I think that's where we are going towards. I think maybe a crisis like this could help us take one step or uh, a few steps towards that direction, that we have good experiments by entrepreneurs, that we could uh, find out new business models that work, uh, where, where local communities benefit, where... Uh, 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 which yeah would fit the idea of regenerative tourism. Um, but I think it's a long way. And I think we are starting. Um, we might, well, maybe then a crisis like this will help a bit. But at the same time, it's also a matter of time before I think we are changing tourism because we've become very critical. We don't accept uh, uh, tourism uh, uh, just as a given or as an economic activity. Uh, I mean, this is what the biggest mo the, the biggest discussion at the moment in the Netherlands, um, where tourism is kind of the, the, the dirty word, so to say, uh, because we want to talk about development and societal development, and then tourism is one of the many uh, uh, yeah, uh, ways to do that. Thank you, Stefan. Um, rather than open that question to the other speakers, we've got one which I think is going to be right in their um, area. It's directed at Ian, but um, I'll then invite Albert to share his thoughts as well. Um, and this is the reality of scenarios suggests that the lines are blurred and that these scenarios could be playing out simultaneously. So Ian and then Albert, your thoughts on that, please. 
you're right. Um, but these scenarios are, are explorative. They're, they're there to make you think. There's never going to be the infinite answer. There's never going to be the, the pure scenario. So one of the techniques that you can use while you are, are working with scenarios is two things. One, you can constantly update and change the scenarios to represent the environment. Uh, but, but other things you, you can do are, th are ask questions like, considering all four scenarios, what are the strategic responses you will take? Because these four worlds are acting out simultaneously. Thanks, Ian. Albert. Albert, we'll just get you unmuted. Hold on. Great. I, I agree with Ian. Uh, what uh, many people always think of is that you can choose a scenario that you like the most and then uh, develop strategies to, to pursue that one. But in fact, uh, it's, it's, it's well, what we try to do with scenarios is try to understand how the future could evolve without saying that it will evolve like that. So it's not a predictive scenario, it's, it's just an investigation and exploration uh, uh, along the extremes to which global tourism could develop. And uh, what, what uh, yeah, public bodies usually, uh, what we suggest public bodies usually to do is to look at all four scenarios together and then to see how, uh, how you could compare for all those futures. Because, uh, uh, well, uh, wealthy businesses, for example, sometimes take one scenario or four times one scenario uh, to be, be prepared for, which is leading to a kind of betting strategy. So if, if, uh, if uh, and then they have a system of early warning indicators with, with, with which they can follow the emergence of the different scenarios and they could quickly upscale or downscale uh, a certain uh, uh, strategy. But for, if, if public money is involved, uh, you have to be uh, prepared for all futures and that, that leads to a robust scenario. So a scenario that resists yeah, all possible futures. And I, I sometimes say, well, you could see this scenario cross like a cube. So it, it, it frames the extremes, the borders of the cube, but what happens within could take any position. And, and that's the challenge you have to, to take in, in, uh, in trying to imagine such a future world. Thank you, Albert. Um, I'm going to jump down to um, Guy Royal's question now um, before we come back to one that's been upvoted uh, from Caroline Orcherson, which is about one of the scenarios. But we'll go to Guy's first. And um, Guy's asking about around who makes the decision around that Y axis around the idea of individual choice versus a more collective approach. And, and sort of has some, if you, can, uh, if you can see the full question there, it's also talking about things like, you know, isn't it driven by the, the, the dollar, who, you know, the client the tourism spend isn't the tourism sector responding to customer preferences so um would you like to explore around kind of a, a little bit more about that sort of how those scenarios how, how that scenario is those scenarios are created around the choice of axes and why that's important oh, yeah, but if, you... I, if i could try to to answer that question uh what i explained in my presentation is is usually collective process so you have uh different stakeholders at the table and uh, each one brings in different background information different expertise different uh, experience also and together you you try to unravel the complexity of our society and together you also cluster uh, the things you've observed in society so it's uh, i don't want to make it too scientific but it is based on social constructivism so what we do is is a construct is is, is a construction of, of the mind of the minds of the people in that setting so it's it's not so much a decision about, from a scientist or by a scientist but it's a collect, collective decision what should be the two axes that we frame our scenarios on and uh, so we usually we, we rank the the driving forces of change according to level of impact, perceived level of impact, and the perceived level of unpredictability. So these form the, the frame of the axis, and all the other forces that we identified get a place in the narratives of the scenarios. So, uh, so both the axis themselves and the extremes are, are, are the result of a collective uh, debate and discussion. 
So can I, can I jump into one of the scenarios then? Um, Caroline Orchison asks around the survival of the fittest scenario, which results, um, which she suggests was resulting in the ex, um, exploitation of nature and the environment, but also points out if the tourism system collapses, would that not lead to less environmental ex, um, exploitation? Because particularly with international air travel significantly declining, hence carbon emissions are reduced. So perhaps we could dig a little bit more into that scenario. If you'd like to... Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll give it a couple of things. Thanks, um, I think with any, any scenario, there's, there's a cost benefit. There's a cost benefit analysis. I, I don't think anybody um, wants a world where we've got... It's the trade-off between climate change uh, and jobs. So, um, but it's it's not a sustainable it's not a sustainable scenario. If you look at if you look if you look at that survival of the fittest scenario, basically, if you look at if you take a sustainable development goals perspective, uh, maybe for cl climate change you're achieving that goal, but you're not achieving the other sixteen goals. Uh, from that type of perspective, you've got poverty, you've got war, you've got collapse. You actually don't have de destinations can't respond to crisis because there's no wealth, there's no money in that society. So it's a very, it's a very dis, it's a very dystopian s scenario in, in the terms of going for going forward in life. There's lots of destitute, there's lots of riots. So um, it's not a world that I would like to live in. Albert, um, in, in your thoughts on that sort of tension in that survival of the fittest around um, uh, the um, exploitation of nature compared to some of the gains we might we might have in terms of um, reduced carbon emissions. Uh, so, in, in line with what Ian says, is, is I, I think in this scenario there's a fierce competition, and anything is allowed in order to 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 make your business uh, or the industry survive. So, and that includes the exploitation of the environment of, of social uh, social structures etc so uh, uh, of course th maybe there will be less flights but there will still be flights but it, it's also what happens in the destinations themselves so everything is done at the cost of the environment uh, of sustainability if you want uh, to to make uh, yeah, tourism benefit from it now we have time for just one more question and we still have a number that aren't have that won't be answered so apologies if we don't get to your um particular one but uh, stefan's doing a great job there um putting some comments as we go through as well i think i'm actually going to end up with um with a quite a sort of a, a broad question and i'm going to put it to to stefan at first and this is tim's comment that tourism will continue people will always want to travel and explore domestically and internationally i like your posing a question back to uh uh, um, our audience member, but can you explore that a little bit more around that kind of, you know, will it always continue? Yeah, I think it's a good question and I think it's a good kind of a prediction that um, we will get back to an old situation. Um, I think if you would leave it up to uh, society, to the, to, to the tourists themselves, I think there's a big um, kind of hunger to travel, um, which is something we've built up for over many decades. So it's very strong, very uh, strong uh, uh, feeling that people have, uh, a right to travel maybe even. Um, but I think it, we will get back to the old over tourism discussion again uh, sooner or later. And I think um, uh, a few months ago, all of us were talking about over tourism and about how to manage growth, how to do crowd management, visitor management. Uh, what type of tourists do we want? Uh, do we allow tourism and uh, uh, the tourism industry to do um, kind of whatever they want. Uh, I think there were a lot of initiatives like um, uh, responsible tourism, regenerative tourism, uh, destination stewardship programs um, kind, of, kind of emerging. I think there were still, I would call them the kind of the grassroots initiative still, but I think there was an, an kind of your, your early warning, uh, if you would like, about potential new futures that we um, don't allow for tourism to grow. And we as then society, the leaders, uh, uh, politicians, uh, because I think the, the impact on local communities could be that big that we just uh, are beyond um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not uh, annoying or irritating, it's kind of we don't tolerate tourists anymore and then we need to find a good, good balance. So the question I think 
yes, demand will grow. People will would like to travel more. The question is, do we allow the supply to develop in that way to match demand? I wonder, I really wonder. Uh, um, it's not up to me, it's up to decision makers, um, but I really truly wonder if we allow that. Thank you, Stefan. Now we are coming to time, so I'm going to leave it on that slightly uplifting point there around um, kind of what is it that we want um, to happen and how do we influence things. I'd like to thank all of those who've attended and I'd like to th thank our three speakers, Albert, Stefan and Ian for a really stimulating discussion around uh, how we can uh, think about the future using scenarios to, and it certainly has prompted lots of questions and thoughts. I'd like to also just remind us that, that um, remind um, uh, the audience that this is one of a series of um, webinars that we're running. The next one is on Wednesday, the 10th of June. That's next week, um, 2 till 3 p.m. So I don't think Stefan and Albert will be phoning in from um, from the middle of the night in, in uh, the Netherlands then, but it's on the role of food tourism in the reimagination of New Zealand tourism post COVID-19. Ian Yeoman will be returning to talk about f um, food tourism trends. We have Joanna Fountain um, from Lincoln University, who's an expert on food and agri-tourism. And we've got Sarah Meikle, the festival director of New Zealand's largest culinary festival, Wellington on a Plate, exploring that question. We've then got upcoming seminars in the next couple of months on smart destinations, destination recovery strategies, value-based pricing, revenue management, and responsible tourism. You can um, find out more and register for all of those on the um, link. You can see that at the bottom there. And once again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you for the crew behind the scenes and those who've been asking questions and following on. Um, the, the recording of this will be released in due course if there's anything you'd like to go back and have a look over. But otherwise, thank you very much um, for joining us this morning, um, Kiora.